Won't you bow and be in prayer with me? Jesus sought me when a stranger. I was wandering from the fold of God. And he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. We are saved by the blood. And God, we thank you that you have kept us through what the saints call danger seen and unseen. And we are indebted to your grace. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this day. I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, invade this moment in our preaching, our hearing, and more importantly, our living of your word. In the name of the one who was before there was a was, and shall be when was ain't no more. In the name that is above all names, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Beloved, I don't want to belabor the moment. I know that it is not customary for a pastor to preach during his or her own anniversary, but I wanted this to be more than just a celebration of a pastoral journey. I wanted it to be an opportunity for us to hear a word from the Lord in what may be our last opportunity to gather in this year in a venue like this as the weather begins to change. And I thank the Lord for granting us a beautiful day to be in this space to work. I'm gonna ask your prayers because I want to do something a little different today. And not only because I'm physically not able to lift my hands the way I want, but being obedient to the Holy Spirit. There, there's a foundational scripture I want to read in your hearing that will then complement with a few others along this journey. I want to read in your hearing from the book of Judges in the Old Testament chapter 6. You need not pull out a Bible if you don't have one or on your device. It'll show up on the screens. Judges chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse number 11 what sets the foundation for what I believe God desires to speak into our living on this day. In the sixth chapter of Judges, according to the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word, verse 11 begins like this. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite. As his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Now that's enough right there. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? If you would pray with me today, I, I want to raise some questions that need some answers. I want to raise some questions that need some answers. I believe I can say without fear of contradiction that I'm not the only one who during seasons of life, especially this pandemic, we've held on tight to certain scriptures that have held our lives together. Judy, one scripture that continues to resonate in my heart almost every day in my prayer is something Paul wrote to us in Romans chapter eight that we preached a few weeks ago where Paul declares these words, you know them well, for we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That scripture has helped me because, Mark, it is foundational to my understanding of what faith really is. 
Faith is not some empty hope. Faith is not a denial of the reality in which you live. Faith does not excuse foolishness and say that you can defy science and data and laws of nature. But faith is the incessant ability to look in every situation and declare with all your heart, something good has got to come out of this. Faith, my brother and my sister, is when you can look it in the eye and no matter what the statistics, no matter what the stereotype, you can still believe in your heart that because our God reigns on high, something good has to come out of this. That God would not carry me through this if there wasn't something good God was going to do through it. Hear me, I don't believe that everything that happens to us is the will of God, but I do believe this, that whatever happens to us, God can transform it for our good. I don't know the origins of this pandemic, but it definitely has challenged and changed our lives. It has challenged and changed the way we do church. I've seen this pandemic rob us of gathering in our sacred space called the sanctuary. Because of the pandemic, we've not been able to hear the variety of the musical choirs that sing the praises to God. Because of the pandemic, we've not been able to pass the peace. Because of the pandemic, we have said goodbye to loved ones without the ability to have a proper funeral and grieve them and support their friends and their family. This pandemic has changed and challenged us. But y'all, some good has come out of it. In spite of all that we've suffered through and struggled with, some good has come out of this. And part of that good is that in this pandemic, God has given us new vision and opportunity to increase and enlarge ministry and do church in some new and exciting ways that we never would have tried had we just been confined to what we'd always done. Some new things have happened. One of those new things is a new way of Bible study called Verses. I hope some of you all watched it. As we complimented Can I Push It and OTOG with now this Bible study competition of who knows the Bible best. And I want to pause and acknowledge our winners of the Associate Ministers NUMA who are now holding the title of the Bible versus champion until next year. In, in our production meetings, as we were prayerfully considering how to do verses, one of the things we struggle with is what game show can we mimic? Can we make it look like Family Feud? How do we do Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? How do we do verses and make it look like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And we finally landed on trying to mimic a game show you're familiar with called Jeopardy. And if you're familiar with Jeopardy, you know that Jeopardy is very different than any other game show because in Jeopardy, it's not the answer that brings you through. It's the question. That in order to play Jeopardy correctly, you know that you win when you're able to ask the right questions because sometimes victory is found in knowing how to ask the right set of questions. I'm not just talking about Jeopardy. I remember going to a parent-teacher conference once in fourth grade. And I was there and the teacher was beginning to explain that the students were going to learn some new math concepts and knowing that my children at that time struggled with math. I asked the teacher, well, how do you know if they're really getting it? And here's what she said to me that I will never forget. She said, I know they're learning when they can ask the right questions. For you see, beloved, it is not always the ability to have the answer that determines victory or progress. It's the ability to look at a situation and ask the right question. And when you ask the right question, you're on your way to growing. And that's not just Jeopardy. That's not just fourth grade math. That's also in your walk with God. 
that God sometimes looks at us and declares that the way I can tell you're growing, the way I can tell you're developing as a disciple, that you are maturing in ministry, are by the questions that you ask. Now, I know there's a little hesitancy right there because many of us were raised in traditional backgrounds that taught us you don't ask God questions. Some of you all remember your third grade Sunday school teacher said that to ask God a question is a sin. It's to live in doubt and to faith and, and not have faith and act like you don't trust God. But some of us have lived long enough now to declare that life will put you in situations where you can't help but to ask God questions. Listen, I know some of you are more saved and sanctified than I am, and your neighbor is trying to act like they got it all together, so don't call them out right now. Let me just be honest on their behalf. Life has put me in some places where I was wondering what God was doing. Life has delivered me to some situations where I was frustrated and I needed God to give an account of what God had let. Has there anybody here who's ever had some questions for God? And the good thing, beloved, is that God is not offended by our questions. God does not stop being God because you don't understand him. And God does not give up the throne because you want God to explain why God allowed that to go down in your life. As a matter of fact, if you read through scripture, you will find that there are really two realities we learn about questions from the Bible. Number one is that there are some moments when God asks us questions. And Barcia, I have read in Scripture and found out that, that God asks us questions not because God doesn't know the answer, but rather that whenever God asks us a question, it is literally an invitation for us to participate in what God is about to do. Don't you miss this? When God asks questions, it's an invitation. Somebody say invitation. So we see that when Jesus shows up at the pool of Bethesda, and there's a brother that's been there 38 years, and Jesus asks him, do you want to be made well? It's not because Jesus doesn't know, but rather he wants him to participate in his own healing. God finds Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones and asks him, can these bones live? Not because God doesn't know, but because Ezekiel has to be part of what God is about to do. When God asks Moses, what's in your hand? It's not because God doesn't know, but he wants Moses to learn the value of using what the Lord has already blessed him with. When God asks Martha, where have you laid Lazarus? It's not because he doesn't know, but he wants Martha to watch what God is about to do. And when Jesus asks Peter, who do men say that I am? It's not because he doesn't know, but wants Peter to be part of declaring, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. God's questions are invitations. But there are moments when it's not God asking the question, it's us. And hear me when you search through scripture, if you ever reach the place where you are asking God a question, that is God creating an opportunity to reveal his will in a new way. Please don't miss this. When God asks us, it's an invitation. When we ask God, God sees it as an opportunity. That when we reach that place where we need to understand what God is doing and we come questioning the Lord, that's God's prime time of revealing. And I've lived long enough now to tell you that every now and then, God will release you into an orchestrated, and an ordained struggle to create a question in you that then allows you to be open for God's opportunity to reveal himself in a new way. Every now and then, God will release you into an orchestrated and an ordained struggle because God knows without the struggle, you won't ask the question. And without the question, you won't be open to the revelation. 
So the storm has come to cause you to question so God can show you what you would not have asked if you had not been in the storm in the first place. I hope I ain't lost you yet. The storm creates the question which prepares the revelation. The pandemic causes questions that open our eyes to the will of God in new ways. Something good is coming out of this pandemic. God is putting us in a place to ask some critical questions that need to be answered. Believe, beloved, I want to tell you that I believe in the depth of my heart that God is transforming us as a people, as a nation, as a body of Christ. And the pandemic has triggered at least three critical questions that the body of Christ must wrestle with to see ourselves through this pandemic. I want to today lift up three critical questions that you and I have to wrestle with that this pandemic has brought to our vision and to our lives. And they're not unique to me, they come out of other places in scripture. So that you can follow me, I want to take you into three different scenarios of scripture where humanity has asked God a question only for God to use the question to reveal his will in a new way. Are you with me? Three questions that open the door for God to reveal his will in a new way. The very first question comes to us in the first book of the Bible. In the book of Genesis, in chapter four, we find ourselves right outside of the Garden of Eden. And in chapter four, a crime has been committed Homicide. Cain, in a fit of jealousy, has murdered his brother Abel. And the deeper crime is that he thinks he's gotten away with it. And then the Lord shows up and asks, where's your brother? Cain tries to figure out, how does God know that I've killed Abel? And this is what the Bible says, the reason God knows Abel has been killed, God says, because your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Because when innocent has been killed, its blood cries out to God. The blood of Emmett Till cried out to God. The blood of four little girls in Birmingham, Alabama, cried out to God. The blood of Mississippi Freedom Vote writers in, in, in the South cried out to God. The blood of Breonna Taylor and Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland and Mike Brown and George Floyd and too many others that should not have to be named cries out from this nation. And to the ears of God, where's your brother, Cain? And Cain looks back at God and asks a question that our nation must wrestle with today. Cain looks back at God and here's his question. Am I my brother's keeper? Lord, you're holding me accountable for his life? I have to give an answer for how my life affected his life? Beloved, I came by to tell you that one of the most pressing questions this pandemic has raised for us as a nation and as a people of God is simply this. Are you your brother and your sister's keeper? How accountable are you to God for how your decisions impact and affect the lives of other people? 
How much does God require you to consider the well-being and safety of others as you live out the own dreams and desires of your life? The Lord wants to know, do you consider yourself responsible for what happens to other people? This pandemic has raised some debates among us as a people about vaccinations and wearing masks. But there's a deeper question. Should I live my life in concern for how my life might impact the lives of other people around me? <laughs> Beloved, I've come by to tell you that within American society, there is a deep spirit of Cain. This belief that I can live my life as I choose to live it, and if it affects you, that's your problem. I have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and I'm gonna do what I want to do, and if my life threatens yours, that's your problem. It is a spirit of Cain that affects America that has adopted this Euro-Caucasian ideology of Rene Descartes. Go on, teach pastor. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I, 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 me, myself, and I. That's Euro-Caucasian. But our ancestors from Zulu had another principle called Ubuntu, where they declared, I am because we are, that there is no me if there ain't no us. That I cannot detach myself from my connection and commitment to your well-being. How can I be well? if I'm killing you. It is the spirit of Cain that exists within capitalism that says that everyone should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It is the spirit of Cain that dominates a free market declaring I got mine, now you go get yours. It is the spirit of Cain that argues against universal health care because I shouldn't have to give any of my hard-earned money and taxes so that the poor and those who are sick could get adequate health care like the wealthy and those who are affluent. It is a spirit of Cain that says every man for himself. And I say that because it didn't mean women because the playing field is still tilted against sisters being able to fight equally and getting paid what they deserve. It is a spirit of Cain that stereotypes the recipients of welfare as lazy, immoral, single, black mamas. It is the spirit of Cain that says, I ought to be able to live my life the way I choose to live it. And if I don't want to wear a mask, that's my choice. And if you get COVID from me, that's your problem. Beloved, this is about so much more than vaccines and masks. It is about trying to understand where is the line that separates my personal freedom and my communal responsibility. I knew there wouldn't be a lot of shouting today, that's all right. I've been here 13 years, y'all ain't voting me out no way. Listen, it, it, th th there's a line between what I can do that I wanna do and how much my liberty ought to be restrained by my communal responsibility to my brother and my sister. I came by to ask you, where is that line in your life? Have you ever sacrificed personal liberty for communal responsibility? 
while you're trying to figure that out, may I remind you of something? And that is that the kingdom of God operates on principles much different than capitalism. The Spirit of God and the kingdom of God is not built on the same principles of the founding of the United States of America. In God's eyes, you are your brother and your sister's keeper. In God's eyes, community rises above individuality. In God's eyes, you don't know how to operate if you don't know how to sacrifice. You are not a growing Christian if you've never said no to yourself. Some of y'all are real good at telling other folk no. But to be a child of God means I've got to learn to look at the man in the mirror and tell him no. Because God values community, God looks at Adam and says, it ain't good for you to be alone. Because God values community when he gives us the Ten Commandments, six of them, the majority, are not about how to relate to God. They're about how to relate to each other. Because God values community, Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, if you see someone hungry and you walk over them, don't tell me you're a Christian because you just walked over Jesus. Because God values community, Paul tells the church in Corinth, nobody has every gift of the Holy Spirit because you ain't a church all by yourself. Because God values community, Jesus tells Peter, when you restore yourself, go strengthen your brethren. Because God values community, John says, you can't say you love God whom you've never seen. And you fail to love your brother and sister who you see every day. You are a liar. Because if all you think about is me, myself and I, you're not growing in Christ. And Judy, I know this is controversial. My job is not to make people think what I think, but just to make sure they think that my decision to get vaccinated was not simply because I don't want to get COVID. My decision to get vaccinated was because I am connected to a community and I want to be certain that we put this thing down as soon as we can and I'm willing to sacrifice for my community. Hey, I had, I was talking to that with somebody who came to me and said, well, Reverend, you don't know what's in that vaccine. And you don't know what's in them chicken nuggets you ate yesterday either. And you still don't know what's in the Long Island iced tea, but you order it. Some say, Reverend, 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 you don't, you don't know what the long-term effects of the vaccine will be. But here's what I do know. That if I am trying to follow the command of God to be my brother and my sister's keeper, how do I doubt that God will keep me and protect me from whatever it will be? I trust God too much. And I have a commitment to your well-being. And I want you to have a commitment to my well-being. Are you your brother and your sister's keeper? Or do you only live for yourself? It's a question you've got to answer. The second question I want to lift up, this is a different kind of sermon. The second question comes during the trial of Jesus. When you go home, I want you to read John chapter 18 and you'll find that Jesus is on trial and you'll remember he goes back and forth and finally he winds up with Pilate. And the Bible says that Pilate decides to have a little question and answer session with Jesus in private. So Pilate takes him out of the presence of the Jews and into the palace. And while they're sitting there, 
Pilate asked Jesus a question. He says, are you king of the Jews? Jesus flips it back on him and says, you didn't just come up with that yourself. Somebody must have told you that. Pilate flips it back and says, hold on. I'm not the one on trial here. You are, your people brought you to me. What have you done? Jesus responds, read it. My kingdom is not of this earth. I've come to testify of the truth. And whoever listens to truth stands with me. And then Pilate asks the second question of today. When Pilate hears Jesus say, I am the truth, here's what Pilate asks. What is truth? I told you all this is a different kind of sermon. The first question, are you your brother and your sister's keeper? Pilate then wonders in the second question, what is truth? Is truth really absolute? Or is truth relative to who you are and where you are. The second question I believe this pandemic has brought to our forefront that we must wrestle with is not only an understanding of where that line is between personal freedom and communal responsibility, but this question, what are your sources of truth? Where do you go to find information you believe. Who's in your ear? Whose report do you believe? Where do you find truth? And before you get all Baptist and religious on me and talk about scripture, I'm not talking about godly truth. I'm talking about truth of the reality of the world in which we live. Who do you listen to to make decisions for your life? And Zena, I would suggest to you that that question is not as easily answered as people would think. It's not easily answered, number one, because there are so many sources of information these days. If you were raised like I was in the 70s, you remember that TV was much different than it is now. We had three, maybe four stations, and they went off at 11.30, 12 o'clock. We had ABC, NBC, CBS, and maybe PBS. And that were the only sources of information we had, news media. But now we live in the midst of social media. And there's a generation coming up under us that don't even watch television, don't even have cable, because for them, the truest source of information is not what they see on the news, it's what they see on social media. They believe your personal cell phone and what you capture on video more than what the news reports. You ain't woke if you ain't on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter will capture something days before the news media even hears about it. And there's a generation that believes what you get on social media is what is true. How many of you all are familiar with the name Darnella Frazier? Darnella Frazier is a bold black sister who had the courage while she was watching the police kill George Floyd to pull out her phone and record it. And had it not been for Darnella Frazier, you cannot tell me that Derek Chauvin would not be in jail right now. He's in jail because a sister recorded it and posted it to Twitter. And because there's so many sources and social media out, now the question you have to ask 
is, well, who do I believe? What source of information is true? Donald Trump convinced a large segment of this society that everything that was against him was fake news. That what CNN was reporting was fake. That you can't trust MSNBC. The only news source you can trust is Fox. And then they put out lies that because others thought was true, they acted on it. So he convinced folk that voter fraud was killing America without any evidence. And now more than 21 states are passing laws to suppress the vote of minority communities because Donald Trump convinced folk that that story was fake, but his was true. Thousands of folk stormed the U.S. Capitol because Donald Trump convinced them he won the election, which was a bold-faced lie. But because they believed it was true, they acted on it. Your source of truth is critical to how you act. Who do you believe? Do you believe the FDA, that the vaccine is safe? Or do you believe Nicki Minaj's tweet? <laughs> Nicki Minaj posted that a friend of hers had swollen genitalia from taking the vaccine. Brother, that ain't what swole you up. That wasn't the vaccine. <laughs> Whose report do you believe? It's not easy because sources we used to trust, we don't trust no more. B beloved, if you were raised in the era of Barbara Walters and Walter Cronkite, you believed the reporters. I don't trust Tucker Carlson. I don't believe anything he says. There's a generation that doesn't trust science. We remember Tuskegee. We know Henrietta, we woke. We know that science has lied to black folk. The church isn't trusted. There's a generation coming up now that does not trust the church. Your hypocrisy, your embezzlement, your homophobia, your mistreatment of women has put them in a place where they don't trust the church. All preachers are guilty. And there are folk that don't even trust your interpretation of Bible anymore. Because your Bible has been used to hurt more than it's been used to help. And with all the sources and the conflicting data and the question of who to trust and the loss of trust in our other sources, it now has been raised. What is your source of truth? That's a pandemic question. And allow me to get deep for a moment. Someone's like, Pastor, what you been doing? In order to get deep for a moment, <laughs> notice what Jesus says to Pilate about truth. He says, anyone who sides with me knows truth. Why? Watch this Bible, folk. Because I am the way. I wish I had a Bible reader in here. I am the truth. 
and I am the life. I am the truth. Beloved, here is the real test of truth. It is not what you believe, it's how what you believe either causes you to align or misalign with the life of Jesus. He hear me, hear me, the, 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 this ain't a Twitter quote, this is too deep. The real test of truth is does what I believe cause me to mimic the life of Jesus in a way that the world sees more of Christ in me. It's not whether I believe Nicki Minaj or the FDA. It's not whether I believe CNN or Fox. It's not whether I voted for Trump or Biden. It's just how what you believe allow the world to see Christ living in you. Because if what I believe does not allow the Christ in me to be seen by those around me, it is not truth. So yes, you can believe Trump won the election. But if that causes you to act in violence that is contrary to the life of Jesus, it ain't true. You can believe that the vaccine is not safe. But if it causes you to then be reckless and not wear a mask and not social distance, it ain't true. You can believe that the United States of America is the greatest nation in the world. But if it causes you to support locking up Latino children in cages and beating Haitian refugees like slaves, then it ain't true. Here's the question. Does my truth reveal Christ in me? Because the one thing you cannot excuse yourself from is living out Christ. I read something this morning before church that deeply disturbed me. And hear me, beloved, I'm not trying to preach about the vaccine, but it's vaccine related. There are now mandates coming out for mandatory vaccination. And as a result, people are looking for both medical and religious exemption. The highest applications for religious exemption in the body of Christ have come from evangelicals, conservatives, and Southern Baptists. Go on, teach, Pastor. The highest application rate for religious exemption are from evangelicals, Southern Baptists, and the conservatives. They believe that they ought to be religiously exempt from the vaccine. I'm not here to argue that. But I would suggest that the body of Christ would fare better if some of them also asked for religious exemption from racism. Because you can't be racist and look like Jesus. I wish they'd ask for religious exemption from homophobia because you can't be homophobic and live out the love of Jesus. I wish they would ask for religious exemption from being a misogynist because you can't oppress women and look like Jesus. Where were your applications for religious exemption when they were taking away the vote from black folk in your state? Where was your exemption? I better get out of here. We, I'm not going to make it to 14. You know who I am. You knew what you was going to get when you came here. Am I my brother's keeper? What is your truth? And here's the last question I want to lift up. It was raised in the first passage we read in Judges chapter 6. In Judges chapter 6, Israel has disobeyed God and have now fallen under Midianite oppression. And the Midianite oppression is so bad that the children of Israel have to hide while they harvest. 
And that's where we find Brother Gideon in Judges 6. He's hiding in the wine press while he's harvesting wheat. And the Bible says an angel is dispatched from God to come to Gideon and say to him, God has an assignment on your life. God is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon looks around at his situation and circumstance. And this is the question he asks. If God is with us, why is all this happening? Beloved, the Cain question is, am I your keeper? The Pilate question, what is my truth? But the Gideon question, where is God? Listen, you may not ask the question of Cain, and you may want to be exempt from the question of Pilate, but nobody in here is going to escape a Gideon moment. At some moment in your life, as saved as you are, as sanctified as you are, as big as your Bible is, you're going to look around the scope of the problems and the pandemic and the trouble and the tragedy and the sickness and the struggle of your life and you're going to have a if God moment. If God loves me, why this? If God is omnipotent, why didn't God stop this? If God is sovereign, why is there a Delta variant? The number of atheists that are being trained by the pandemic has yet to be discovered. Because there's a generation that will wonder, how can there be a God if there is this? You ever had a Gideon moment? You ever had a moment when you couldn't understand where God was in all this? Where is God? And somebody, maybe today you've come to this Sunday service in this pandemic, you won't wave a hand because you're at church and you want folk to think you got it all together. But there's some of us that have had some Gideon in us. When mama died, where was God? When the doctor said stage four, where was God? When they laid me off that job and kept that brother that didn't do half of what I did, where was God? When the one that loved me don't love me no more, where is God? When my child lay sick, where was God? Where is God? And the answer is right there with Gideon. And I'm done with the sermon today. We'll get out your way. But watch what happens. I'm going to have to do it a couple times because it's so simple, it's complex. Gideon looks at the angel that God has sent and asks, where is God? Gideon looks in the eyes of the angel God has sent and asks, where is God? Gideon looks in the eye of what the Lord has sent and has the audacity to ask, where is God? Where is God? Right in front of you in what the Lord has sent to you. I don't know who I came to preach to today, but you saw the hand of God this morning. You saw the blessing of God this morning. You saw God at work this morning. When you opened up your refrigerator, you were looking at God. When you chose your outfit, you were looking at God. When you parked your car all the way down the street, you were looking at God. When you sat yourself down with all your sins in the presence of the Lord, you were looking at God. Do me a favor, touch somebody, tell him he's right in front of you. He's in what he has sent. Don't let the pandemic blind you to the blessings God has sent. Can I push it? 
He says, Gideon, it's right in front of you. And watch this. You are thrashing wheat in the wine press. You're harvesting in the wine press. Now, now the wine press ain't where you want it to be. But even in a place you don't want to be, God is still giving you a harvest. It may not look the way you want it to look, but you still have a harvest. It may not go down the way you thought it was going to go down, but you still have a harvest. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I came by to find about five folk that can declare right now, Pastor, not only am I making it, but it's better than I thought it would be. Is there anybody here who's got a harvest in the midst of the pandemic? Got a blessing in the midst of the pandemic that God's been good in the midst of the pandemic. Bills paid, arms moving, family blessed in my right mind. Somebody praise God for the harvest in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goodbye, but I'm so glad he's not just keeping me, he's blessing me, he's prospering me, he's enlarging me, he's favoring me. I need some Gideons to shout right now. God's blessing me in this thing, in this thing. In this thing, hey, hey. Listen, if you can, don't run out yet. It's time for the table. But here's the question. How accountable are you for the well-being of those around you? What is your source of truth? Is your life bearing fruit that looks like the life of Jesus? And where is God? Right in front of you. What the Lord has sent to you and how the Lord is blessing you in spite of this is proof that God is still with you. Lord, I thank you today for giving me a call to care about my sister and my brother. Lord, I pray that you would break the spirit of Cain that, that our society breeds within us and remind us that I am called to care about your life. And Lord, whatever my truth is, wherever I find it, whatever I believe, if it does not bear Christ likeness in me, remind me that it is not true. And finally, oh God, don't allow me to miss that you're right in front of me. This day you've given is a sign of your presence. The strength I had to make it to Meriwether is a sign you're with me. The fact that I'm not here alone is a sign that you're with me. Thank you, God, for allowing me to prosper in the midst of this pandemic. In Jesus' name.